So what do you get when you take essentially a GT40 style American made race car and replace the ground pounding 427 V8 with a jet turbine engine from a helicopter? Well, you get the Howmet TX or Turbine Experimental. Hey guys and gals, welcome to Rare Cars. This is a YouTube channel where we break down the world's most fascinating performance vehicles and what makes them so unique. If you want to learn more about vehicles just like the Howmet TX and others, then hit that subscribe button because we have plenty of new videos coming in the near future. Now let's find out what makes the Howmet TX itself so unique and so fascinating. Inception and design. While the Helmet TX is not the first turbine powered race car, it was the first to actually win a competitive race against other internal combustion engine vehicles. In fact, it was actually able to squeak out two SCCA race victories during its only year of competitive racing that it competed in. It all started when racer Ray Heppenstall started to develop a concept for his own turbine powered sports car, making improvements where the previous Rover BRM turbine race car had fallen short just a few years prior. Heppenstall believed that a turbine powered car could be more competitive and more effective if the chassis itself was given a simpler design. Heppenstall initially pitched the project to Williams Research and then to the Allison Engine Company, both of whom said no. Finally, after exhausting all the options that he had available to himself, he finally asked for help from a fellow competitor in the racing space, who was Tom Fleming. At the time, Tom Fleming was the vice president of the Howmet Corporation, a company that produced castings for turbines which were used in the aerospace sector. Heppenstall got to talking to Fleming and eventually was able to persuade Howmet that supporting a competitive and distinct sports car would actually be able to raise the company's profile. Howmet consented to provide the money and the name to the project itself, thus beginning the journey of the Howmet TX. Eppenstall initially purchased a Cooper Monaco sports car to start the project, but then later realized that it was not ideal for a turbine application and then sold that chassis. It turns out the process of converting a gas and turbo combustion engine car to fit a turbine into the existing chassis is not as easy as one might think. Eppenstall then hired Bob McKee, the proprietor of McKee Engineering, to construct two completely different chassis for the vehicle. The first was an older McKee car that he created for a Can-Am series race in 1966 that they then subsequently modified to fit the turbine engine in it. This vehicle served as the basis for the first space frame chassis. The second car, GTP2, was built from the ground up so it could be specifically planned to employ a turbine engine from its inception. This included a chassis that was two and a quarter inches longer or 57 millimeters longer for those that use the metric system. The car was also internally referred to as the Mark 9, even though in actual practice all cars used the Palmet TX name and moniker. The Mark 9's fully unique mid-engine layout that contained the turbine engine was only constrained by the range of competitor accessible engine sizes because it was built in accordance with the FIA's Group 6 rules for sports car prototypes. Bob McKee created a closed cockpit body with going doors to conceal the mid-engine configuration of the Helmet TX. The car had disc brakes and a typical double wishbone suspension with coil springs for the time. Nestled between the cockpit and the turbine was a 32 US gallon fuel tank, or 120 liter tank, that contained the jet fuel that powered the vehicle. The power plant. The two Helmet TXs were powered by leased turbine units that were provided from the Continental Aviation and Engineering Company. The TS325-1 gas turbines were prototypes from an unsuccessful offer for a contract to build military helicopters, which Continental was no longer using at the time since the contract fell through. The borrowed turbines were capable of producing 350 horsepower and a whopping 650 foot-pounds of torque. The turbines themselves also only weighed about 170 pounds or 77 kilograms. These turbine engines were also able to reach a maximum RPM of a whopping 57,000 revolutions per minute, a number that's essentially inconceivable for any internal combustion engine. Through the use of reduction gearing, a two-stage configuration drove the back wheels as an internal power turbine. The Helmet TX only had one gearing speed since the typical gearbox was not required because of the wide variable output of the turbine engine and the high amount of torque that it had. However, the differential's ability to instantly alter the gearing ratios allowed the vehicle to be modified to fit different circuits, which is a strategic advantage for the Helmet TX. However, there was no gearing for reverse because the transmission was a single speed model. The FIA required the usage of reverse despite Heppenstall's initial preference to forego it, thus a small electric motor powered by the turbine was built to enable the reverse movement of the vehicle. Two sizable center exhaust pipes were used by the turbine itself. A third pipe, however, was positioned off-center to work with the wastegate. The wastegate was created to alleviate the delay that occurs when the accelerator is pressed and the turbine revolutions increase. The wastegate assists in controlling the flow of hot gas from the core to the power turbine once it reaches maximum revolutions, boosting or reducing power output to the gearbox much more quickly than the core could alter the mass flow on its own. The FIA employed an equivalence model to calculate the Continental TS325-1's displacement of 2,960 cubic centimeters or 181 cubic inches. Despite Heppenstall later admitting the fact that the engine was actually beyond the 3 liter limit because the turbines cannot be tested in the same way as a piston engine, this made it impossible for the Helmet TX to compete in the Group 6 prototype under 3000cc category. 
racing history. The first race on record that the Helmet TX competed in was the 1968 24 Hours of Daytona as part of the World Sports Car Championship. Both Helmet TXs were brought to the race, but only the newer car, number GTP2, or also known as the Mark 9, was actually used in the race. Heppenstall, Dick Thompson, and Ed Lowther's driving trio qualified eighth overall at their lap time. The Helmet was able to move up to third place early because of several rivals making early pit stops for fuel. But on lap 32, the turbine wastegate unfortunately failed to open, giving the driver too much power for the corner that he was in. As a result, the car hit the barrier mid-corner and the team was forced to retire the Helmet TX from its first race. The car, although meeting an untimely ending for the race, showed great potential for the track in the future. A few weeks later, the TX was able to increase its speed and qualify for the 12 hours of Sebring, just behind a Porsche 907 and a Ford GT40, both of which were formidable racing cars for the time. At Sebring, the turbine first functioned dependably, but as the race went on, debris damaged the turbine and caused it to shake free from its mounts. After six hours, the Helmet TX was forced to retire from a race yet again. The Helmet TX continued on the string of bad luck in the next few races as well. The Helmet squad followed the international championship back to Europe after Sebring. At Brands Hatch, they made their BOAC 500 entry. The car crashed yet again once more, this time after seven laps due to internal wastegate issues. Then, the Helmet team entered English driver Hugh Dibley in the national sprint race at Olton Park. But the TX was once again prevented from completing the hour-long race due to the breakdown of the starter motor during a pit stop. Instead of remaining in Europe for the rest of the Air National Championship, the TX traveled back to the United States to compete in the SCCA National Championship. Closer to home, the experimental TX's issues were resolved when the video completed its first race, the Vandergraaf Trophy in New Cumberland, West Virginia. Heppenstall managed to set a new lap record for the circuit while also driving the vehicle to a second place finish. The TX then made its way to the heart of Dixie celebration in Huntsville, Alabama after retiring in Michigan the race prior. The field starting order was established in a brief sprint race that was run the day before the main event. The Helmet TX was successful in the sprint, securing a first place victory. Following that, the TX took control of the competition and won again in the main race. These two triumphs were the first first time the turbine power car had ever won in actual competition. After those wins, Heppenstall was once more accompanied by Dick Thompson for the Marlboro 300. Once more, the car dominated the brief qualification race to take the lead for the start of the main event. This time, however, the Helmet TX went on to lead every single lap of the actual race, winning by a whopping 11 lap margin. With the opinion now being that the Helmet TX was ready to compete on the world stage, both TXs joined the six hours of Watkins Glen, another round of the Air National Championship. Heppenstall and Thompson shared the second car, while Hugh Dibley and newcomer Bob Tullius were seated in the first car. The TXs ended up being the 8th and ninth fastest cars in qualifying, respectively. During the actual race, early Porsche factory vehicle mishaps pushed the TX cars to 3rd and 4th overall. However, in the last hour, Dibley and Tullius' car's transmission broke, forcing it to crawl around the track until the race was over. The other car was able to finish the race and actually placed 1st in its class and made it onto the podium overall. Helmet received 4 points for the international championship thanks to the podium finish. Following the triumph at Watkins Glen, the two vehicles were then set up to compete in the 24 Hours of Le Mans, which had been postponed until September. The same drivers were put in the same vehicles as the last race. But at the Circuit de la Sarthe, the long straightaways hindered the turbine car's qualifying performance. The highest placement the Helmet TX was able to receive in qualifying for the 24 Hours of Le Mans was 20th. The race itself did prove to be much better. Early mechanical issues caused Thompson's TX to struggle just after three laps. The car had to stutter down the circuit's lengthy straights because the fuel system had an issue where it was unable to supply the turbine with enough fuel to enable it to operate at full capacity. The other car required a lengthy three-hour repair after suffering a wheel bearing failure that had not been related to the turbine itself. After that, the car was only able to continue at slowed speeds. After only 60 laps had been completed, the car had already been disqualified by the race organizers in the sixth hour of the 24-hour competition. Thompson then crashed into Indianapolis corner with his TX, which was still running low on fuel because of the issue that was having. This concluded the first season and the last season for the Helmet TX series of race cars. Evan Stahl himself made plans for 1969 once the 1968 season was completed, including the creation of a new multi-gear transmission to take place from the single speed unit. Halmet, however, did not believe that the program was effectively promoting the business and made the decision to end the project altogether. This marked the end of the racing career for the Halmet TX as a whole. A rather lackluster ending to a career in racing that could have been one of the most unique of all time for a vehicle. The remaining two Helmet TX cars bounced around ownership and underwent restorations over the following decades. Two more replica cars were actually built and to be used in vintage racing series, and to my knowledge, are still out running to this day. And that is the unfortunate and tragic story of the Helmet TX Turbine race car, the car that was never meant to be. So if you enjoyed this video and docuseries, we'd greatly appreciate if you could drop a like and share this video with other enthusiasts. Also, make sure to subscribe to the Rare Cars YouTube channel because we have more documentary style videos just like this coming out on the world's most fascinating vehicles every single week. Until next time, enthusiasts, have a good one.